Uh, hello, my name is Steve Burns, and I'm the president of the Untermeyer Gardens Conservancy in Yonkers, New York, just north of New York City. Uh, this garden was called the most spectacular garden in America in the 1920s. This is a, a newspaper article uh, in Baltimore. Uh, there was a very large mansion that had been built uh, at the south end before Untermeyer's day, lived in by Samuel Tilden, among others, but it's not an architectural issue today as it was torn down in 1946. Uh, Samuel Untermeyer is a very interesting person. He was uh, 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 one of the most successful lawyers in America, a brilliant investor, fabulously wealthy. He was Jewish, born in uh, Virginia, 1858. His wife, whom he married in 1883, after having had two children out of wedlock, was Lutheran. So this was a very, very you know, interesting couple who really loved each other despite you know, the conventions of the day. Um, in 1916, uh, he hired William Wells Bosworth to design what he wanted to be the finest garden in the world. There's a letter in the Rockefeller Family Archives from Bosworth to um, John D. Rockefeller Jr. saying that this is what Untermeyer wished. He hired Bosworth because Bosworth had designed Kiket and he wanted to outdo the Rockefellers, <laughs> which one could argue he did. Um, this is a plan of the garden back uh, when it was uh, originally built. The mansion was off to one side on the, on the south, and the property kept on growing to the north over time. The most famous garden is a Persian garden or a walled garden, which I'll show you. Off of that, uh, there's a lower terrace, a pool here, and is the vista, which goes down, uh, d uh, down the hillside. The Hudson River, by the way, is here. There's a lower street here. The Croton Aqueduct is there. Um, uh, then at the base of the overlook was a, a very long, almost a thousand foot long Rose and Dahlia garden with a long garden next to it. And parallel to the vista uh, was a series of gardens called the Color Gardens, each planted in a single color, blue, red, you know, yellow, et cetera, all axially aligned. There were 60 full-time gardeners in the day, and 60 greenhouses. It's easy to remember, 60 and 60. He had 150 acres. He opened his garden to the public one day a week for 25 years. And the only other garden, you know, important garden that we know that was open on this level was Longwood. And Longwood, of course, was way, way, way out in the country. So when DuPont opened his garden, you know, people who happened to own an automobile might go there. This garden is five miles from New York City. You could take a streetcar there. You could take a tram. So it was many, many, many people went there. And this was a world famous garden in its heyday of the 20s and 30s. So these were the color gardens. And then there were the uh, Italian or vegetable gardens here also terraced, which no longer exists, but which I saw the ruins of in the 1990s. And there were these rills, it was total jungle, and there were these rills that were buried under soil, and I excavated, and they were all lined in cobalt blue tiles with marble fountains, all gone. Uh, oops, oops, oh, there we go. Um, and uh, that is sort of the more formal part of the garden. There's a mile-long carriage trail that went up to the mansion, and then off of that are a series more informal part of the garden, and the most important part of which is the Temple of Love, which has been restored. Um, the rock garden, which we are going to restore this fall, starting in about two weeks, Sundell Garden, which is uh, a ruin. This is what remains today. So the, the north part of the property is now a hospital. The color gardens are mostly uh, owned by the hospital in a, in a parking lot or jungle. The nursing home was built over the Italian garden, so those vegetable gardens, those are gone. Um, the mansion was De destroyed in 1946, and there was another hospital built on the other side, a cardiac hospital, which is now home for developmentally disabled children. All the land across the street, which um, where he had a dormitory for unmarried gardeners, that's all been, uh, 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 it's all garden apartments now. So from the 150 acres, 43 acres still remains, so that's not bad. And you know, you think of great gardens of the world, 
English gardens, French gardens, many American gardens. They may be beautiful gardens, but they don't have particularly great views. This is a garden that is a magnificent monumental garden with a spectacular view. So it's a very, very blessed in that respect. Uh, the, the walled garden is a Persian garden. I like to say it's the finest Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere because it's probably the only Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere. But this is uh, Cyrus the Great's Persian garden. Uh, and uh, Persian gardens are, are surrounded by a wall and have crisscrossing water canals. This is the, what, what, what remains of it. Uh, Persian gardens were originally probably Zoroastrian gardens. Muhammad was born a thousand years later. They become Islamic gardens, and when Islam spreads, that garden form goes with it. This is the exterior of Untermyer Gardens. So they, these are walled gardens. These walls are almost 20 feet tall. A, a, a large entrance tower here. Just talking about maintenance and architectural issues. Water's getting in everywhere, just like at Blythewood here. You can see stucco falling off of of the walls here. The city of Yonkers, which owns it, had done very elaborate restoration of the central tower, but the whole roof of the tower, there wasn't a roof. So um, uh, the roof was over 50 years old, a flat roof. So it just shows you the sort of preposterous and, and you know, absurd improvements that the city of Yonkers was making, spending good money without taking care of waterproofing above. Um, they actually replaced uh, the columns and, and the and the timbering of these corner towers, but the the coping stones, which are like a, a foot wide by you know nine inches high, had no mortar joints with them whatsoever. So they they sort of did the frosting on the cake without dealing with any of the underlying issues. So this is what we're dealing with now. I happen to be an architect, so I'm sort of can do double duty that way. This is the front gate here. Again, this has been restored. Now we have a roof and we have drainage and all that here. This relief of Artemis over the front gate here is an allusion to Cyrus the Younger's garden, which was Cyrus the Great's um, uh, grandson. You go through, it's, it's based on the Garden of Eden or paradise. The word paradise in the ancient Persian language is paradisa, which means surrounded by a wall. Uh, and, and then when you get into the garden, what's interesting is that it's basically a Persian garden with Persian design, but there's like a Greek classical overlay. And um, so there's Hellenistic architecture and pre-Hellenistic architecture. So what's very interesting is over the front gates of paradise, there's a horizontal block of stone, a triangular block on top of that, which is a reference to the Lion's Gate in Mycenae, uh, 1200 BC, Whoops, which you see over here, so the triangular block on top of that. So Ab Bosworth is incredibly um, sophisticated in terms of his knowledge of architecture history. Uh, when uh, these gardens are Islamic gardens spread, of course, you go to Spain. The, one of the greatest gardens in Europe is the Alhambra. And notice the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the basin here. This is not a crisscrossing water canal system, but just a single. And these symbolize, by the way, the four rivers of paradise, which are described in the book of Genesis, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon and Bihan or whatever, the four rivers. Um, but notice also the crenellated tower. You get a sense of what uh, Bosworth was looking at. And again, here, here we are at Untermar. This is one of the, uh, the rivers here, and this is a direct quotation from the Alhambra. Uh, uh, Persian gardens go east into India. The, all the Mughal gardens are Persian gardens, of which the most famous is the Taj Mahal. And if you look at the plan of the Taj Mahal, which is here on the left, you see uh, most Persian gardens are surrounded on all four sides by walls, but the Taj Mahal and Untermyer are only surrounded on three sides by walls. So Untermyer, uh, the Taj Mahal, you can see walled here, corner towers, major entrance here. You go in, crisscrossing water canals, the four quadrants of land, each subdivided into four. And of course, there the tomb is at the end, and then the view to the river beyond. At Untermyer, you come in through the entrance tower, quarter, corner towers, crisscrossing water canals, each quadrant divided into four. Um, and in lieu of the tomb, we have an amphitheater. Again, that sort of Grecian overlay. And then a, a Grecian-style temple over here, but then a Persian-style pool with the ziggurat shape. This is a picture looking towards the amphitheater with these magnificent Cipollino columns with sculptures by Paul Manship. Um, the annuals uh, change every year. This was a few years ago when we did elephant ears. 
This is a picture during the height of the Depression when Samuel Untermeyer shows his um, gardening staff, which has been reduced to like 40 <laughs> from 60. <laughs> Um, and this is on one of his weekly open days when people are looking at one of the 60 greenhouses. Uh, as you go through the garden, uh, the walled garden, again, the Grecian overlay, you get the three orders of architecture. This happens to be Doric uh, columns here, beautifully now planted with tropical plants, potted plants. Again, the annuals change every year. You see the bubbling water, which is very characteristic of Persian gardens. Again, the, the manship sculptures. Manships uh, sculpted the Prometheus and Bound at Rockefeller Center. This is what it looked like uh, uh, two years ago. Very interesting. The slot of water here is an allusion to Shalimar in uh, what is now Pakistan. The, the, the paired columns are an allusion to Boboli Gardens in Florence. So that's the whole world of garden architecture you see in this garden. Uh, the, the magnificent mosaics. And this is another huge preservation challenge because mosaics are not designed for our client climate. They're really not designed to be really outdoors. I mean, they are in, 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 in Greece and Italy, but they're originally sort of inside houses. So we have exterior mosaics in our climate. And so water you know, kind of gets between the mosaic stones. And in the winter, it freezes and buckles. And so it's a huge, huge, huge problem. This is the stage of the amphitheater, which is magnificent mosaics, and they're based on a, a, a fresco fragment from uh, 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 ancient Mycenae. Again, and this is opposite the, My the Mycenaean gate on the other side, so we have this like Mycenaean moment going on. We plant different sort of uh, uh, overhanging uh, plants uh, at the North Pool. Untermeyer was famous. If you go to like the New York Botanical Garden in the fall, and they had that chrysanthemum show, which is just like unbelievable. Samuel Untermeyer did the same thing, but that was his private garden. So he did that. So all of these were, were bowers of chrysanthemums that came down and the crenellations on the wall. Each had planters with chrysanthemums that were trained to go down in the 20s and 30s. In a Persian garden, you're supposed to be overwhelmed by the beauty of nature. You see the fish swimming. You hear the birds calling. You smell the flowers. It's supposed to be this rich sensory experience. This was, again, a different planting. When we did marigolds in honor of the Indian heritage of the garden, it's in, Bosworth described it as an Indo-Persian garden, and marigolds are sacred to Indians. They have them at their weddings and important events. We have magnificent aquatics uh, throughout the, uh, the, the pools of the garden. This has just been restored. Uh, the city had done a terrible restoration in the 70s, leaving 100-year-old pipes in place, but doing little modern taps off of that. It was a disaster. Again, the worst possible thing. So we had to rip up all the concrete, put in new piping, a huge effort, which we have just now completed, thankfully. Here are the mosaics. Here you can see where the mosaics are buckling away all over. We At least when we, when we went there, the city had done absolutely nothing to try to preserve everything. So people were like peeling off mosaics, kids peeling off and throwing them in the pools or just taking them home with them. So we, we, we sealed them up with concrete so there's no loose edge. So at least, you know, someone's thinking about trying to preserve it. That is the temple of, this, of the uh, uh, sky looking up. And this is when we started, we were just starting to open the view. The view is much more open now. This is looking at one of the corner towers, uh, working Timothy Tillman, who's the head gardener now, and Marco Polo Stufano, who many of you may know was our, is our horticultural advisor. He recommended Timothy. So we have what I arguably say is the, one of the greatest gardens in America with Marco, you know, one of the greatest horticulturists in, of, of our, in our country in its history. And Timothy, who is his designee to take over um, really, I think we'll fill in his spots. But here you can see Untermeyer in his day. Again, he had 60 full-time gardeners, so he would just put in millions of annuals, millions of both, ripping things out one season after another. We can't afford to do that. So we have this mixed border with a lot of woody stuff, and it looks very nice. But that's what it was in the 30s. That's what it is now. That's when he did chrysanthemums on the lower right. This is what it is now. What it is now. Uh, again, what we planted, I think it might have been Marco's idea, to plant these fastidiate uh, sweet gums to sort of emphasize the verticality of the corner towers. 
magnificent um, atlas cedar. Um, there are not a lot of uh, surviving Untermeyer trees, but what we have are just incredible, including two of the most beautiful weeping beeches you will ever see in your life. Uh, we've established now, it's been in the ground for three years, a, a very long, you know, 400 foot hydrangea border with intermixed with many other things, many different types of hydrangeas. That shows the, that, that temple from below, that was the Untermeyer's swimming pool. And that is what it looks like now. So you can see the utter devastation of all the mosaics that's happened from the buckling. So we are actually hoping to restore the Temple of the Sky next year. We have a three uh, tripartite thing is the, pool, uh, the, the, the canals in the Persian Garden. We have finished this year. The second thing that has to be done is the temple, which we uh, have gotten funding from the city to do next year. And then the big project will be the, will be the swimming pool. And we want to raise the bottom of the pool so it's not a, no longer a swimming pool. It's shallow. It's a reflecting pool. We will not drain the pool ever. We will heat it so it doesn't freeze. And we will run the pool year round. So we won't have this problem with mosaics. But this is the quality of the mosaics mm. that are all these sea creatures sort of embedded in the mosaics of the swimming pool. So this is an article from the New York Times, October 29th, 1939. A crowd of 30,000 persons today visited the free flower show at Untermars. Superintendent revealed that many of the visitors came from foreign lands and distant parts of this country, as well as the city to see all the flowers. Additional policemen were necessary to facilitate the movement of traffic and lobbying. So 30,000 people came in one day. So when you come down to the lower terrace, you come down to another loggia that's at the north end. And Untermeyer and his wife went to Europe every summer to look at great gardens. And also his family originally came from Germany. They would go to Berlin. And there's a whole interesting story there with, with, um, um, with uh, Albert Einstein that I won't get into. But um, he had been to the Villa d'Este in Lake Como, which is now a very fancy hotel. And it had a, a feature there that he really admired. And he asked Bosworth if he could design something for him like that. And of course, like any good architect, he said, yeah, sure, no problem. So what he designed, this is at Lake Como. This is at the Villa d'Este. So these uh, cypresses going down to Lake Como, mountains in the distance. This is actually a stepped fountain. And this is what was designed for Untermeyer. So he had cryptomeria on either sides, beautiful, in, uh, <laughs> intricate sort of limestone with turf joints going down. Uh, this is the Hudson River and the Palisades beyond. In terms of its scale and descent, it is very similar to the Villa d'Este in Lake Como. When we started, this is what it looked like. I mean, all of the um, cryptomeria had died many, many years ago. The weeds, this is actually looking pretty good compared to when we really started, the weeds were like six feet high. They towered over most people's head. Um, and this is what it looks like now. Hmm. So we removed all these Norway maples that had, you know, totally almost couldn't see the views. And Untermeyer mistakenly, Bosworth wanted the trees to go on the outside of the wall, but Untermeyer made a mistake. You know, Untermeyer was a smart guy, but I don't think he was the greatest gardener in the world. And he put the trees on the inside. And I think all the trees failed. They did, couldn't establish root systems, the snow, they collapsed on each other. So Timothy said, why don't we put them on the outside, which is what they did at Lake Como. And now suddenly you have a much broader uh, say, and look at the bottom at those columns. Those columns are ancient Roman columns, 2,000 years old, mm. made of Cipollino, and they're, and they're monolithic. I'm moved on. Okay, I'm going to move on. Thank you. Next to that were the color gardens. These are all in ruin, and we're hoping to do a land swap with the hospital to get them back. That's what they look like now in some areas. This is the bottom color garden. This is what it looked like when we started. Many of them had fountains. You didn't even see the Hudson River when we started. This, at least we've cleared it out. Now you can see the stairs and we've opened a view to the Hudson River. And then below that was the Rose and Dahlia garden. That's what it looked like back when we started. And now we've sort of cleared it out. Again, opened the view. You can sense the, the Hudson River. To the right of the columns, we've now mowed the grass below that. And there's an intricate pattern of steel edging in the grass. And huh. this uh, March, there was a light snowfall, and the steel edging melted the snow. And we could see the ghost of the original parterre pattern huh. that came on, which is very interesting. And, and next to that was what we call the long garden, which is about 1,000 feet, 1, feet long. 
Then beyond that were the Italian gardens. These were the ones. These are where the nursing home is now. This is where the cobalt blue tiles were. This is the lower gatehouse uh, along the um, aqueduct. Uh, it was so obscured, a, a tree had fallen on it and uh, ivy grown over the tree. You couldn't see it. We removed it and saw that the gatehouse is about ready to collapse. So we've, we've uh, strengthened it uh, and we removed the graffiti on the outside of it but we are keeping the graffiti on the inside of it. There are no windows, there's no floors, no roof, and there's gonna be a ruined garden inside it and around it. So it's gonna be a ruined garden with graffiti on the uh, inside. And behind it is, a, is like a cave that's gonna be turned into a grotto. Then there are the uh, lion, and th these have just been restored today. I can say these have been cleaned, very exciting. We know from that hoof that this headless horse was actually a unicorn, and we've restored it as a unicorn head. This was the uh, Temple of Love off to the side. This is what it looked like when we started. This is what it is beginning to look like. That is, um, uh, for that, this is all uh, five waterfalls coming down. This has been, this was restored a few years ago. This is the Cascades down below. Planting's just starting to go in all around. This is looking from the Temple of Love down at the lower Cascades. And that's the Cascades now. So it used to look like this. This is what it looks like now. Um, these were the rock gardens. This is going to be started to be restored in two weeks. This is what it looked like. The Smithsonian Archives in Washington, what it looked like in the 30s. This is what it looked like when we started. You couldn't see anything. It was not visible. We looked at a map and we saw a tiny little line. We said, what is that line? And we dug it up. So that's what it looks like now. But that's what it looked like before. And this is another part. This is what it looked like in the 30s. This is what it looks like now. And then in a few years, this is the uh, Sundial Garden, again, totally uh, in, in, in jungle. Now, this is a picture of Samuel Untermeyer setting his watch by the uh, <laughs> Sundial. <laughs> there were great sculptures. All of, this is a fountain in front of the mansion. Some of you may know it's in Central Park at the Conservatory Garden. It's called the Untermeyer Fountain. He bought it in Berlin. There was a huge auction after his death. This was uh, in the East Stoa. You can see on the left, this is the auction description. Important Greco-Roman sculpture, marble torso of Aphrodite, 3rd through 2nd century BC. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my lecture. Thank you.